Good afternoon. We'll now hear the presentation of Mr. John Roman. You have 10 minutes. You may begin. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, CRTC staff, thank you for allowing me to appear before you today. For years, people have complained about the prices in the Canadian telecommunications system. Some observers correctly argue that Canadian telecom prices are falling, but our prices remain high compared to international norms. Of course, consumers often complain when they hear about record profits of a company they pay monthly. That's just human nature. But pricing isn't the only issue facing the Commission uh, that the Commission must consider here. So instead of delving into pricing, something you've already heard about at length, or other issues I've raised, I'd like to change the focus from whether MVNOs are good or bad, though I'll be happy to answer questions on MVNOs later. Instead, I'd like to focus on something of direct importance to the CRTC itself, your effective authority. The importance of this room, these hearings, and the authority vested in you by Parliament to decide such matters is beginning to be undermined, albeit not presently to the degree that it completely degrades the process, but, and it's a significant but, if this de facto regulatory sedition increases, our system of telecommunications regulation will be diminished. As I've mentioned in earlier submissions, there are foreign telecommunications services providing competitive services to people residing in Canada. These services do not appear currently to be subject to CRTC regulations, but they necessarily do make use of Canadian infrastructure. This isn't something to be heralded as competition winning out, but a failure of adaptation and a lack of foresight. Instead of Canadians guiding competition through their own regulatory tributary, Competition has eroded our regulatory riverbanks and is starting to flood urban centers. Our domestic prices are too high and foreign competition, having seen an opportunity, has been able to burrow into the market with the promise of lower prices and or better service offerings. The result is a two-tiered system that benefits not those playing by the rules, indeed those not even governed by the rules, at the expense not yet of Bell and Rogers, but at the expense of the Commission's own regulatory authority, which is being flouted. I refuse to see this regulatory body as some scarecrow in a field of corn that acts more as an ornament than a protector. For decades, one of our system's key tenants has been protection of the domestic market, but there comes a time when necessary protection can wilt into mere protectionism of domestic companies. Such misguided protectionism is inconsistent with the other statutory purposes delineated in Section 7. Commissioners, the central issue isn't of MVNOs, really. It's not technology or competition, but about an underwhelming situation in the competitive market. Yes, prices have come down, but they've come down from being too high then to being too high now compared to international norms. This leaves us in a quandary. The problem isn't only domestic competition, it's also international suppliers beginning to compete with, inter with Canada's telecommunications providers. We regularly see reports of how much Canadian subscribers pay compared to international markets in France, Britain, Australia, etc. And now some of that competition is finding its way into Canada by the back door. Surely this requires that we recognize things from a new perspective. MVNOs are a domestic solution that would further isolate the Canadian market from the international market. In fact, just another Band-Aid. They offer, at best, an inferior solution to a logical one formally opening the market to international competition. International competition should not necessarily be viewed as a problem for a country that has free trade agreements in the works or already negotiated with various regions around the world. Indeed, given that the domestic market is relatively small, Canadian telecommunications companies should relish the opportunity to compete for a billion customers in Europe, for example. Why not consider letting Orange and Vodafone into our market, and in reciprocity, Bell and Rogers into Europe? It would be reasonable to contend that since 2012, the CRTC has effectively employed and even prioritized 7D of the Telecommunications Act. But there's a distinction between promotion of ownership by Canadians and foreign competition in the domestic market. Moreover, I question whether it's reasonable to assign Section 7D preeminent importance over every other policy objective of the Telecommunications Act in Sections A through H. Indeed, if seven policy objectives are collectively better served by opening up our market to foreign competition in addition to Canadian-owned services, 
it would seem only right to do so. This logic is supported by the findings of the Supreme Court case Canada v. Vavlov, paragraph 121. Quote, the administrative decision maker's task is to interpret the contested provision in a manner consistent with the text, context, and purpose, applying its particular insight into the statutory scheme at issue. It cannot adopt an interpretation it knows to be inferior, albeit plausible, merely because the interpretation in question appears to be available and expedient. Let's look at each of those three in turn, text, context, and purpose. I would suggest that interpretation of the text, promotion of control of Canadian carriers, should not be misconstrued as pro prohibition against entry of foreign service. As long as the market has fostered and delivered healthy Canadian options, the legislative requirement for their promotion has clearly been met and the interpretation of the text is satisfied. Context did not previously include foreign competition in the domestic market. That reality has, however, now altered, so the context has necessarily changed, and therefore interpretation should be re-examined. It could be argued that as long as the Canadian carriers were permitted market entry, sorry, market entry, our telecommunications system was intended to be a closed system. However, now that the original regulatory wall has been breached by advanced technology, Great and yawn signs may be flashing to attract other would-be entrants. There's no way to know if the current trickle will become a torrent, but ignoring a leak never works out well. Finally, the purpose. Although for decades there's been a wall around our fair market, the point of the policy was to protect domestic ownership of our homegrown Canadian carriers from foreign acquisition. That this automatically precluded foreign entrants from competing in the Canadian marketplace was also a great boon to those carriers. Though the text would seem to imply differently. If we assume that the intent was to permanently prevent foreign competitors from entering the market, then it's failed in its purpose because it's been frustrated by a regulatory bypass resulting in an inferior outcome. Ultimately, the Commission must determine what optimal outcomes it can, uh, that can result from this hearing. Despite protestations from the largest telecommunications providers, competition has been deemed to be insufficient to deliver a consumer-friendly market. MVNOs seek entry into the market, claiming their arrival will reduce consumer prices. That was not the lesson learned from the introduction of Wind Mobile. Moreover, your regulatory, regulatory authority is being bypassed by foreign entrants, harnessing new technology that was created long after the Telecommunications Act was written. The conclusion one should draw adds up to but one option. The Canadian telecommunications regulator should act to allow controlled access by foreign entrants into the domestic market. De minimis non curat lex. The law is not concerned with trifles. In 2014, I appeared at the Let's Talk TV hearing and predicted what would happen to Canada's broadcasting sector, and more particularly, the CBC. Sadly, time has supported my predictions. I come before you today to warn even earlier of a problem in the offing. We've seen how the trifles of today can become the tragedies of tomorrow, and I hope that this time the CRTC will take a proactive stance. <laughs> if the Commission decides it has the authority to make such a determination, this could be done after a three to five year lead up time through wholesale rental of spectrum and or network access, which will continue to protect the principal control of Canadian airwaves by Canadians while supporting our telecoms transition to a more dynamic and competitive marketplace. If, on the other hand, the CRTC is convinced it lacks the authority to make this decision on its own, I suggest that the Commission either request the powers to de uh, be delegated by the Government of Canada, or that the situation be remedied as part of the anticipated revisions to, the, to Canada's telecommunications legislation. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioner Levy. Good afternoon. Um, just a quick question for sure. you um, in terms of your background uh, in the field. Um, can you tell me a little bit about where you, where sure, you got actually, your experience? Um, I was actually asked that question back in 2014, the exact same question. <laughs> um, I grew up in this field. Uh, my father started PIAC um, a number of years ago, and um, my mother was also involved on the broadcast side, so I grew up around you know, with this around the kitchen table, I couldn't avoid it if I wanted to. Um, and after going to law school, I found that this was something I was drawn to. Uh, 
excuse me. Um, in your um, submission uh, posted in November, you indicated that while the new unlimited mobile wireless offering may be viewed as an improvement, the ones that were introduced last summer, these new offerings still fail to compare favorably to plans offered by other foreign wireless carriers, mm -hmm. such as T-Mobile in America or Optus in Australia. Can you explain why? Um, I had a graph in the form there that I don't have in front of me, but I'll endeavor to do my best. Um, so for years, I believe it was even in the 2016 hearings and the 2017 hearings I appeared at, um, Bell and Rogers all said, we have a different market. We weren't doing, um, we were not doing unlimited. We were just doing, Canada's market is to build up. Well, you pay for what you get and you have the best networks in the world. And uh, frankly, they're right about that. But at the same time, you pay for what you use and it might be expensive. Um, and then as a result, they'd said, you can't compare apples to oranges. We cannot compare the Canadian markets and our infrastructure system and how we pay for it compared to um, say Australia or Europe or America. And recently in, uh, with Shaw coming in, taking over wind, uh, bringing in freedom, we have a system where now it's an apples to apples comparison. So we're seeing that the family plans are not necessarily better uh, compared to some of the American options. Now, are the proposals great in rural Canada? No, they're admittedly not where they need to be yet. Um, but in urban centers, we're seeing that a family plan for four is very different from what you can get as a family plan for four um, from Bell or Rogers or Telus. Um, you point to lack of capacity as a reason <clears throat> for data overage charges and suggest that this means it's unlikely there's much spare capacity for MVNOs to use. Is that still your, your position? Uh, um, <clears throat> That was, a, that was an argument made in 2016, 2017, that they were saying, look, we, ha we have a problem with capacity. We're trying to build out in advance, and that's fair enough. Um, but that this was one of the reasons that prices were high intrinsically, because they had to have plans that would restrict use, because otherwise bandwidth would just be unavailable. Um, I take commuter trains sometimes in Toronto, and packed into a sardine can of a commuter train, there are times where my data just doesn't work, just because there's so many people trying to access the network at one time. So I'm sympathetic to that argument. Um, however, there comes a point beyond which where you have to have saturation of um, access, where in theory you've got enough infrastructure built up so that you can provide sufficient um, coverage. If but just excuse me. So in light of the introduction of all of these plans, right. we're unlimited. Yep. Um, is it still true that there's there's a limit on the on the capacity, or there is a, 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 a too small a supply? Right, and that's an excellent question to ask, but I don't think I'm the right person to have the answer for that question. Okay. Um, I would say that if the arguments were of a couple of years ago still hold, then that would be intrinsically no, they would not, uh, or the argument would still hold, and then they could not have space for MVNOs. If, on the other hand, now they build up sufficient infrastructure to allow for MNVOs, great. But then, alternatively, they could also just offer less price for a gig of data. So that would have been an alternative as well if they wanted to be competitive that way. Um, could you expand on um, your opinion that um, full MVNOs would be the obvious choice if the Commission were to mandate wholesale MVNO access? So why would this model be more obvious than a model that leveraged the facilities-based carriers at the regional level, for instance? Um, I'm going to have to circle back to that at a later point. I haven't had a chance to review the MVNOs as of late. Um, but I think what I was trying to say is a model that they have to build up some infrastructure as opposed to being, um, for lack of a better term, um, opportunists of just being able to jump into the market with no infrastructure or no, no requirements to come in, aside from just showing up with a contract. Uh, they have to contribute something to the market, more or less, was what I was trying to get at. And you have suggested that um, the issue of MVNO access opens up opportunities to allow in um, foreign MVNOs. Um, 
so I take it that you don't share some of the concerns we've heard that have been raised by some with respect to entry by well-capitalized companies as MVNOs. Um, intrinsically, I'm inclined not to be a big fan of MVNOs in general um, in this, uh, for this process. Um, I see this as the Commission has sort of hemmed themselves in, and I don't mean you directly, but over a period of time. Uh, to say that you, you've wanted to have a fourth competitor and a fourth competitor and regional competitors are now in the marketplace. So what is a reasonable amount of time to let that system flourish, that, uh, to allow that competition to grow? I'm not saying I have the right answer to that, but it's something to be determined. Uh, I think Commissioner McDonald said earlier today that if not now, then when is the right time to intervene? Um, and maybe that's a fair point. I'm not saying that it is or it isn't, but if you're going to allow competition to operate completely, then should we not allow Shaw more time to grow into its market capitalization? Um, why is now the time? So I would say it's either a for competitor and regional marketplace, or it is a you might as well open up the market in its entirety. Um, either or seems a more prudent option. Okay, uh, just a, a couple more questions. In your submission today, you talked, you said that uh, we re we see reports of how Canadian subscribers pay compared to international markets. Mm -hmm. And then you say, and now some of that competition is finding its way into Canada by the back door. Mm -hmm. Would you like to elaborate on what you mean by, sure. by the back door? Um, so uh, from people I've talked to um, who don't work in this industry, um, they've said, many of whom have uh, dual citizenship, they'll say, okay, well, you know, I have a family member in um, America or I have dual citizenship. I'm just going to get an American plan and I'll bring it here. Or uh, a student studying abroad coming to Canada from Europe or from Asia will say, I can use a residence there as my, as my point of access for a phone line. There's no point in me getting a Canadian phone plan here when it will cost more. And the coverage I get here through reciprocity of um, a local carrier to get coverage in Europe or Asia um, allows for eight to 10 gigs here at a lower price, pro uh, effectively. So at that point, it's sort of, it's a workaround of the system that wasn't intended and probably wasn't foreseen, but it's happening. So this is anecdotal. It's, you don't have any no, um, facts to, to back that. No, this okay. is just what I've, I've been told. And why I wanted to raise it early so that there could be an approach taken um, in case it needed to be resolved. Okay, I think that that uh, covers all of my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, maybe one quick question for me, um, maybe by way of summary. So in a perfect world, what would you prefer to see? How would you prefer to see the market in Canada evolve right now? Would you prefer to see large, U.S. mobile companies come to Canada, um, see the government change the foreign ownership rules, see MVNOs, a full MVNO made available in Canada, um, restricted to Canadians or perhaps not. What, what's your, what is your bottom line? I'm, I'm struggling Ooh. to sort of fathom what you think is the best solution. Sure, I feel that I've just been given the golden goose of everyone who's been at, who would want that question. As long as the goose doesn't take too long to lay its egg. So, uh, in the international business world that Canada sees itself in, we see a number of people going abroad. It makes sense for us to have Canadian networks who are operating in, say, Europe or South America, where businesses are are operating from Canada, but businessmen or, and women are still going there. Similarly, the Vodafone network or any other, orange, doesn't matter whom, um, it would make sense for them to be able to have reciprocity here. As to changing the foreign ownership rules, um, I'm not sure how much of the foreign ownership rules need to be rewritten as opposed to reinterpreted. Um, I think it was section 16, and I could be wrong, I'm just not going to stare down and try and be quick here, but I think that it, it allows for a situation where we can have foreign entrance into the market. It just has to be done through the right way um, and through a reinterpretation of what we're trying to have as an outcome. To that end, I'd 
I'd love it as a hypothetical if we could have Canadian carriers offering services much like how TD has expanded into the United States. And in a similar capacity, if we would have um, competitors who want to come into the Canadian market, great. I don't see that um, MVNOs, whether Canadian or foreign-owned, will necessarily be as successful as, um, I think it was um, Mr. Bibbick said, portfolio-based companies. Uh, it will be not an automatic uphill transition that will be very difficult, if at all possible. Um, the interveners who came before me uh, said they wanted to have one, per, uh, one MNVO come in. Um, I was sincerely hoping that that was an option that was available. When I looked over the uh, Telecommunications Act, it didn't look like that was easily. That would also require a reinterpretation of the Act. So if we're talking about reinterpretations of the existing Telecommunications Act, um, I'd say opening up the market to increased competition is probably beneficial. And since everyone seems to compare to the international market, why not let the international market in to really see what was available? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time to share your views with us.